Hallowed be thy name. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you, Father, for your mercies. Thank you, Father, because your mercies are new every morning. Thank you because great is your faithfulness. Oh, we bless your name. We thank you for you are good. Your mercy is like the, 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 the mighty mountains. Your justice is like the ocean wide. Your righteousness reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. We bless your name. We give you all the glory. We say, Adonai, Adonai, Eleloi, Israel. You are worthy of all our praise. You are worthy of all our worship. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you, Father, for, for, for today. Thank you, Father, for what you are doing already. Thank you because you are moving already in our midst. Thank you, Father, for your word that is about to come forth. Thank you because you cause your word to come forth with power, with the Holy Ghost, and with much assurance. Thank you, Father, because every single one of us part that, that is part of this service will be mightily transformed. As your word goes forth, Father, we ask that you will cause it to do that which you sent it to do and that you to prosper in that which you sent it to do in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way. Take control. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's let's have our seats. Okay, so last week we started um, the fundamentals uh, mega series. So I was saying that there will be different mini series in the big series. Um, there are that, that is the fundamentals. So we are looking at. Those foundational principles, those foundational truths, the fundamental truths of our Christian faith. And um, we are saying that the Bible says that um, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So that gives us the, the, the point that foundations is very important. And then we looked at um, 1 Corinthians 3 where Paul was seen as a wise master builder, that he laid the foundation. Let's just look at that. 1 Corinthians 3.10. So it says, According to the grace of God which was given unto me, over from verse 9, it says, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take it, how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we saw that the only foundation that can be laid is Jesus Christ. Then verse 12 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, a stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Um, okay, so... That was, that was one of the things we looked at, that it is very important. The foundation upon which we build is very important. We talked of, I believe, the parable of the two people that built houses, one on the rock, one on the sand. The person that built on the sand would have finished his house much quicker. But we saw that when the test, that is the constant thing in life, comes, either you're a believer, either you're an unbeliever, tests will come challenges will come. Just like those two houses, those two buildings, the wind came, the rain came, the floods came, and beat upon the houses. It was the one that was built upon the rock. The person would have taken more time to build it. That was the person whose house stood. And the other person that just quickly did it, maybe to save costs somewhere and, and in another place, eventually suffered loss because the Bible says the house fell and great was the fall of it. So it would have suffered lots of loss. So we also as believers, we are supposed to take our foundations very important. You see, the thing that separated the foolish virgins, the wise virgins from the foolish ones was that extra oil they took, the extra mile they went, the extra precaution they took. 
the extra. That is usually very important. The Bible says that if you have done only that which is, um, Jesus was saying it that um, if you've done that which is only required of you, you should call yourself an unprofitable servant. I'm paraphrasing now. Say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done that which was required of us. So if we do the bare minimum, we have been unpro- like we are we are being unprofitable. So that extra, that extra mile, doing that that thing that separates us from the rest of the pack is always very important. Usually, what who God looks for in a generation is a man. The Bible says, and I sought for a man. So God was searching the whole earth. He was looking for someone that he could show himself through. So usually God is always looking out for one person, that one person that would do the right thing. In the land of Babylon, God saw that one man, Daniel. In the olden days, like one of the earliest books of the Bible, Job, you, you, you saw that man in his generation. He was someone that faced unprecedented um, challenges and he still stood firm. He held his faith. So usually God is looking out for one person that will do the right thing. One person that will go the extra mile. That is why it is important for us to take that extra care, extra precaution in building our foundations. Because the Bible says that God will shake the heavens and the earth. And the purpose for shaking the heavens and the earth, the, 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 the purpose for why God shakes all things is so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. And as we saw in that parable, it, is only, it was only the one that was built on the rock, that was built on solid ground, on solid foundation, that withstood those tests, those challenges. So also, when the shakings that God is bringing comes, God is separating, like if you, if you harvest some things now, there are some, okay, which food is common here? Let's say we want to pick beans. Someone just finished um, 96, 120 hours of... Um, of cookathon, right? And part of the process is that she spends some time cooking beans. That's that's just a joke, sure. But you you know that if you are not careful, if you pick, if you just carry beans and you put it on fire like that, you are likely to encounter some stones in it. So that's why it's, it's important to pick. So also, if you, it's just because we don't. The the kind of rice we see is always like the finished type of rice. They would have removed the back and all that. There are some that they still have that back behind them. So they have to blow them so that the chaff will get away. And then it's the real um, rice grain that will remain. So also, God does all these things. He brings all these shakings. He brings all... He he, he allows these shakings so that those that are actually true will be known. So that it will, it, it, the, the distinction will be clear as day. So that is why we had to, we are, we, are, we are to take that extra care to build the foundation. Paul kept saying this word. He said, "Be rooted and grounded." So it is very important for us. If any tree, any tree that will grow, usually trees that will grow very tall, they also have very deep roots. So because we are going very high and we are, we are going to be taking different types of teachings um, over time, it is good that we take those foundational principles very seriously. And I pray God will bless us in Jesus' name. So I mentioned this, um, some of those foundational principles I will look at. I said this, they are not the only ones, but if you look at Hebrews 6, Hebrews 6, verse 1, I remember starting from Hebrews 5, and um, that Paul was castigating the Hebrew church. He was saying that though you are supposed to be leaders at this point in time, but you still need milk. You still need someone to teach you the things that are the basic principles of Christ, the elementary principles of Christ. So he was saying because they, they, they were unskillful in the word of righteousness, that they were babes 
And he's, he, he, now dis, he, now, he now gave a description of who a, a strong person is, who, a person that is an adult who is a f- of full age. He said, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. That's verse 14. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So I was telling us that exercising your spiritual muscles is very important. You don't go to a gym and the very first day you go from pot belly to six packs. It's not possible. It's not, have you seen anybody like that before? No. The first day you go, the first week, probably even the first month, the changes might not be so so much. Like the changes might not be be too many like that. So, but over time, you begin to notice those changes. So also, I said, when you exercise your muscle, you, you know here it says those who, by reason of 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 use, they've exercised their senses. So faith is a sense. Some people call it the sixth sense. Faith is a sense, a spiritual sense. So if when you exercise it, you might not see the result at first. When you you believe God for something. You stand on the scripture. You declare a thing. You declare a thing. Say, for instance, maybe you are traveling, and the rain wants to fall. You now remember, uh, Joshua said, "Sun stand still, moon stand in the valley of Israel." You say, "Rain don't fall until I go." I, say, I declare by faith. And maybe it's as you are saying, "Amen." And that rain now starts. <laughs> Every downpour <laughs> now starts. You didn't waste your faith. The faith didn't go to waste. You have exercised that muscle. Most of the people that work miracles now, they they started from the point where I think was it that the other prayer that was given was saying something that he prayed for someone that was sick, and that was when the person now died. So he was now wondering that ah, did God call me? Am I anointed? You know things like that. So they, like they, he decreed something. It was the adverse. It was the opposite. He was seen. But he kept at it. That's the, that's the secret. And I said, you, you keep doing it. You keep exercising that muscle. You just find out that one day, the muscle is strong enough to face the challenge. And then once you've, you've the spiritual things are such that if it's like a door, you know, lots of times the scripture talks of things like doors, like gates. It's like door. Say for, say, if water is in, if, if water Let's say there's a reservoir now, and then the reservoir has a small door. You know, if you open it a little, water will come in, right? Water will come in. So you might be forcing, forcing it. Maybe it's difficult to open, and then you're trying to open it small by small, small by small. Those, those little, little changes, they are like when you're still exercising. But there comes a time, if you stay with it long enough, that that realm, when you open it, it opens up to you, and it is yours for life. I was giving us an example that God's servant there, Bishop, he, he, he spent 28 months asking for wisdom. Asking for the spirit of wisdom. 28 months, two years, four months. And nobody can deny it that that spirit is not working in, in him. So it is like if you keep pushing, keep pushing. When the Bible says, ask and it shall be given unto you, seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you. The explanation of that part is not just ask once. It says ask and keep asking. If you check, I think amplified version also. It says ask and keep asking and it shall be given unto you. Seek and keep seeking and you shall find knock and keep knocking and, shall be, and the door shall be opened unto you. So the idea a lot of times in, in, in coming into the fullness of, re, of, of a reality in God is that you keep pushing. You keep at it until you, you, you get the result. You know, Jesus said, ask until your joy is full. So if your joy is not full, that means don't stop asking. Do we understand? So, um, then he went in, in, in chapter 6 of Hebrews, he, he went on to mention the elementary principles. He said, therefore, leading, leaving the principles, he said, the elementary principles, the first principles, the, the foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. He said, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That means he had laid the foundation before. 
You get so not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So we also are meant to lay that foundation. Then of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And he said, this will we do if God permits. So he said they were going to lay the foundation again or they will go over it again if God permits them. So it is that, that I, I was not saying all those things so that, so that as to give us the reason why it is important for us to focus on the foundation. So I, we also spoke on um, Genesis 1 where God said, let there be light and there was light. Then I told us that that light, uh, okay, so Genesis 1, um, verse 3 or so, God said, let there be light. And then if we go to verse 14, and then God said, let lights appear in the firmament. So what's the difference between, if, if God had already said, let there be light in verse 3, why the need for light again in verse 14? So I was telling us that the light in verse 1 is actually the light of life. The verse 2 says that the spirit of God was brooding upon the face of the deep. And I said, the spirit quickens. It is the spirit that gives life. So when God wants to do something, it is a release of his life that will bring light. The Bible tells us that um, in you are the bundles of life. In your light, we see light. The Bible tells us that the word of God um, was life. And the life was light unto the world. So it, it was in him was life, rather, and that life became the light of men. So comparing that to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you see that it was the Holy Spirit that was breathing life first onto the creation, onto the face of the deep. And then God declared, Let there be light. So that light is the light of God's life. So it is it is not the physical it doesn't have to be the physical kind of of light that we see but it is a life like god's one of god's servants say that light one of god's languages is light so it might not be physical light but you when god said let there be light something changed in all of creation the life of god manifested as light Okay, so that was, those are foundational principles. Those are foundations just to introduce us to the series. And then, so now let's start today. We are looking at um, our identity. You know, we started last week, identity. So today's one is our identity as the sons of God. Our identity as the sons of God. So Genesis 1. Let's go from um, to the beginnings again. Genesis 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the day. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So that's the first day. If you go on, on to verse 9, it said, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 10 says, And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called ye seas. And God saw that it was good. Verse 11 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So we saw that when God wanted to make vegetation, when he wanted to make herbs, when he wanted to make fruits, what did he speak to? Verse 11, he said, let the earth bring forth. So God spoke to the earth to bring forth grass, to bring forth plantation. If we go to verse 20, he says, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly 
the moving creatures that have life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So when God wanted to make creatures in the water, what did he, who did he speak to? He spoke to the waters. So God, what God spoke to the waters. But when it came to the case of man, okay, let's even go to verse 24 again. So it says, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. So when God wanted to make animals, again, land animals, God spoke to the earth. Then verse 26 said, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he in male and female created he them. God wanted to make man when God wanted to make, let's start from when God wanted to make all those creations, He spoke to another element. When He wanted to make herbs, He spoke to the earth. When He wanted to make sea animals, He spoke to the waters. But when God wanted to make man, He spoke to Himself. So God said, Let us make man in our own image. So that shows you that man holds a special place in God's creation. So, this leads us, okay, so the, but then if you now go to Genesis 2 verse 7, Genesis 2 verse 7, just to explain more, he said, and God, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. A man became a being soul. So, God himself formed man. That was when God himself was, the, the other ones, God said, God said, God said. But this time around, it was, thank you. But this time around, it was that God himself formed man and then God breathed into him the breath of life. And then the Bible says, man became a living soul. So, that means when God first formed man, before he breathed his breath into him, that means man was a dead soul. Do we understand what I'm saying? So, as I said before, that it is the spirit that gives life. It is the spirit that quickens. Where the spirit is absent, there is no life. Before God could say, let there be light, the Holy Spirit needed to brood upon, upon the face of the deep. So, here also, man was a dead soul. And then when God breathed into him the breath of life, he became a living soul. So, it was at this point, after God made man, that we can, and, and then God created Adam. That is the point where I can say that Adam became the, a son of God. How would I explain? A, the created, a created son of God. You know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God. Let me ask you, are you a son of God? If you believe you're a son of God, raise up your hands. If you believe you're a son of God, raise up your hands. Yeah? So, I believe I'm a son of God. But, you know, the Bible tells us that Christ Jesus was the only begotten son of God. So, Adam... And as we came also through Adam, Adam was a created son. Let's look at Luke chapter 3 so that we don't look like I'm speaking error. Luke chapter 3. So this place was speaking of the genealogies of, of Jesus Christ. So from verse um, 23 it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. So they started Jesus' genealogy. They started tracing it. And then if you go to verse 38, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, 
which was the son of Adam, which was the son of whom? God. The scriptures cannot be broken. Adam was a son of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are sons of God. So it is the spirit's presence in us that makes us sons of God. So at the fall, when man fell, man went back to being a dead soul. Because the man didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him again, man, Adam, stopped being the son of God. So God had to send himself. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God had to send himself dimension of himself that was the word. Jesus, as we know him, existed or he exists still in the dimension of the word. Like the word as the word of God. Don't worry, it's going to all make sense. As the word of God. And then, when he came to the earth, he did what he was supposed to do. And at age 30, when his ministry was about to start, at the baptism, Jesus Christ, um, the Father said something. He said, this is my begotten, uh, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. So there, he also got the title, he also got the name of the son of God. He was the only begotten son of God. So, Adam lost that sonship. He lost the presence of the Holy Spirit at the fall. So, God sent himself and came to redeem us back to God. And because of that, through Christ, we become sons of God. So, I want that to be established in our hearts today. That number one, I am a son of God. Please, I want you to say it after me. I am a son of God. I am a son of God. I am a son of God. Yes. So the devil will want to attack that reality. That's one of the, the first realities that the devil will want to attack. When he, when, when, he, when, when he went, when Jesus Christ fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and then the devil came to tempt him, what was the, what was the first thing he was saying? If you are the son of God. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread if you are the son of God. So, that was the first thing in Jesus' ministry that the devil tried to attack. And the devil also knows that if he's able to, to move you away from that belief or to shake you from that belief that you are a son of God, he has, he has practically shaken you from every other thing. So, but if you have that reality grounded in you, first of all, that I am a son of God. Every other thing can, can fall into the rightful place. So, I, I know there have been some times where, like at home, where uh, maybe some days people are working, and maybe I'm just in the room, I'm just resting, sleeping. It will be like, so I think sometimes it's always like, um, Okay, and even when they finish cooking, let's say we are making food Sunday now, like maybe we are eating palladium and all that, so people will be making food, I'll just be sleeping, I'll just be resting after service. When food is ready like this, I might be the first person to come down to come and eat. <laughs> but if someone looking at me from outside can say, this man, he did not even join anybody in cooking, and he's not the first person to come and eat. Like, that is not... But I, I've said it before, I've told uh, my wife that I, like, I don't need to do anything to prove that I'm a son in this house. That is, that is like the first, that is like the first thing that we, we need to know. You don't need to prove anything. 
that we are sons of God. If the devil can get you to the point of trying to prove, that was what he wanted to get Jesus to do. If you are the son of God, oh yeah, do this thing. If truly you are. Jesus is the son of God. So he didn't need to prove anything to the devil. So you also, we also, we don't, like, there are some things we don't need to prove. Like, I know there is there, there the mindset where um, people will say, until you do something, you are not a child of God until you do. If you have believed, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, you have confessed him as Lord, um, and you have declared that God, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. You are saved. Nothing can, like, the fact that you fast 20 days, or 20 hours out of 24 hours in a day, Seven days a week, 365 days a year does not make you more a child of God than a person that just got born again. Don't get me wrong. Rewards can be different. But sonship, this fact that we are sons of God is the same for all of us. God loves all of us equally. It is now our love for God that will determine some things. You know, the, um, the Jesus, the, 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 the differentiating factor in some of the parables is, is the love you have for the Father or the, the love you have for Christ Jesus. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So it is in all those ones, our own love for God that will determine different things. Maybe the rewards we will get, all those other things. But God's love is constant. I want us to, to get that ingrained in our hearts. And this is a picture of, of, how, of how redemption works. Or, or how it, it works. This is a picture. So imagine two people, twins, they were born. So identical twins now. Uh, there, there's this man of God that himself and his brother are twins. So he said that there have been times that he used his own face. Like maybe with an iPhone. Used his own face to unlock his brother's phone because they look alike. So, he, like, he unlocked his brother's phone with his own face. So, they are twins. So, imagine twins like that. Both of them were born in, let's look, which country? Maybe in Nigeria. Let's say both of them were born in Nigeria. And then something happened, one thing or the other. Maybe, God forbid, there was an issue or something. Maybe crisis. Let's say it was during the civil war. And then, they wanted to travel out. So they wanted to run and travel out. But in the process of it, one of them was left behind. One of the twins was left behind in Nigeria. And the other one went with, his, with the parents to, let's say, the UK. Like one of the countries that has the strongest passports. Let's say UK. So the other one grew up in the UK. And... Um, Yes, so he, he had been looking for his twin brother all this while. Whereas the other twin brother was so angry, was bitter that they forgot him in Nigeria and he started going around doing bad. I can do bad all by myself. So he was doing bad up and down until he got to a point where maybe he killed someone and then he was arrested. And he was to be killed. So he got into the news and people were like saying, ah, someone is on death row. He killed someone. And then his twin brother in the UK saw it. That one, God has helped him. He has become like a top diplomat, say, in the UK. He has connections everywhere. Or maybe he's just doing any job, sir. So he now saw in the news that his brother in Nigeria has gotten into trouble. He's on the death row. They are going to kill him so, 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 and so did. So he left the UK. Meanwhile, you know, he has spent some years in the UK. He would have gotten British citizenship. So he's, he has both Nigerian and British citizenship. So this is just a simple, this is just an analogy. It might not be perfect. but So he comes to Nigeria and then you are, I know you would have watched films like 24 where maybe um, someone is to go somewhere, they will change the bodies or maybe prison break. They will change the bodies. They will use a body double and the other person that goes to die is a different person. Or the, like you, you understand those kind of scenarios. So this guy goes 
in place of his brother. Maybe they were going to execute him. And because he has some maybe high-level connections, he swaps himself for his brother. So I, was, I, 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 I watched a recap of one scene in 24 where Jack Bauer, he, he faked his own death because they were after him. They wanted to kill him. People from his own unit wanted to kill him. So he couldn't run. They knew everything about him. So he had to fake his own death. And then himself and someone, they were shooting each other. And then he just behaved as if they had shot him and he was dead. So all of them were saying, ah, they, they just wanted to go and, like, they wanted to go and dispose his body. But meanwhile, he had planned with, like, two or three other people that they would, sh- they would inject him with, there's this, I don't know the name of the, of the thing. So they injected him, and then he came back to life. So, but on record, he was dead. So he died for, like, I think he would have clinically died. So, say for like five minutes, he was dead. Then they revived him. You know, there are some people also that, that have died. Some people died on the, they, they just slumped on the pitch. So, they had to do CPR to resuscitate them. Those people could have died for some time. But after some time, they resuscitated them. So, that was, let's just say something like that. That was what this guy just planned. That they, they injected him with something. And on the face of the whole world, in front of the whole world, it was like he died. But as they carried his body out, five minutes, they neutralized that thing that they, the death poison that they injected him with, and he woke up again and he disappeared. Say so he went back to the UK. So he gave his passport to his brother. That passport, the brother used his passport to go to the UK. He himself found a way, one way or the other, to go back to the UK. So both of them now went to the UK. So I know this story is uh, is summer. I might not know how to say the story, but you get the point. So on record, this guy that grew up in Nigeria is what? is dead. The guy that, that actually committed the crime here in Nigeria is now in the UK living as his twin brother. So we also, we committed a crime that was worthy of death. Christ came in our place. He actually died. But because he had the joker, he could wake up, he could rise from the dead. So according to the records, we were dead or we are dead. But when Christ died, Christ did not just die for us. He died in our own name. So that we now, we will be living in his own name. Now imagine that guy says, the case has finished though. Let me be using my previous identity before. And then he goes, carries his Nigerian passport, goes and he tenders it somewhere else, like anywhere, UK or anywhere. They will arrest him for, for identity theft. That he's trying to use a dead person's particulars. Do we understand? So, also, when as believers, we are dead. We no longer exist. The Bible says that we no longer live. The life we now live, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So the life we now live is the life of Christ. The old man, that one has access to nothing again. So if we try to access, that's why the Bible says, in, his, in my name, in my name, anything we want to access in God can only be accessed through Christ. That's why we can't say, I'm a good person, I've done this. Uh, those ones, the Bible says, all our righteousness are like filthy rags before him. So we cannot go in our own name again. That person was a criminal. They were looking for him up and down. They eventually caught him and they killed him. So we cannot... If we try, if we try using that identity, we are going to get ourselves into trouble. So, do we understand? Do we understand? So, it is important that you know. Jesus also said that um, no one can come to the Father except by me. So that is the first thing. No, number one, I am a son of God. But number two, I cannot access 
anything in God outside Christ. I cannot access anything in God outside Christ. Thank you, Jesus. So if you look at Galatians 2, Galatians 2, just to buttress this point, I want to like use scriptural back to buttress it. From verse 15. So these Gentiles, the people in, in, in the church in, Gal- in Galatia was, was um, Paul was quite angry with them. If you check verse um, chapter 3, he said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So, he said they started out in the spirit. So, when they got saved initially, it was a case of they were, they were saved by grace. But now, they had gotten to the point where some people came to them and confused them and said, except you obey the law. The thing that got us into trouble in the first place, like the, the law that could not save us from death in the first place, rather, because the law is good. Um, the thing that couldn't save us from death in the first place. So, they, 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 they started in the spirit, but they wanted to be made perfect by following the law. So, Paul was angry with them. That Was that what I taught you? Was that the teaching that you received? Was that the teaching that got you saved? So that was what he was saying here. So Galatians 2 verse 16, he says, Knowing this, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Verse 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So he's saying that, that we are seeking to be justified by Christ, but we go ahead and still try and commit sin. So we are trying to still take up that identity of the wrong, of the dead person. That, so he was saying that, God forbid. Verse 18, he says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. So that verse 18, you see, he says, If again you build those things which you destroyed, you make yourself a transgressor. If I take up those things, which could not save me. If I now want to be made perfect in that, if it is um, in Colossians, you see words like touch not, uh, like don't touch this thing, don't eat this thing, don't do this thing. Like those, are the, those weren't the things that got you saved. Or was that what got us saved? No. So that is not what will keep us in salvation. It's not the things. It is not the things that couldn't get us saved in the first place that will now make us perfect after we've gotten saved. So that was how he now said in verse twenty. He says, "I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live; yet not I, but Christ liveth in me." So it is no longer I that lives, but it is Christ that lives in me. So the identity I carry now is the identity of Christ. When God looks at me, he sees Christ. He sees his son. When God looks at me, and he said, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do we understand? If you look at Let's look at Romans 3.20. Romans 3.20. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, 
there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, we have borne the, the, the image of Adam. We bore the image of the sinful of, 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 of the sinful man, of death. But now, we are to bear, we, we bear, rather as we are saved, we bear the image of Christ. We bear the image of the heavenly. We bear the image of God. We have been restored. We have been redeemed. Jesus Christ didn't just, he didn't just die for us. He died as us. Jesus Christ died as Emmanuel. On my record, that was how Jesus died. On that cross, it was our names that were written. That were, he died in, in the name of each and every one of us. Okay? So that is why it is important for us to live lives that are worthy of Christ. The Bible tells us that the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died so that he might bring many sons into glory. Let's look at Hebrews 6, I believe. I just want to I want us to establish those things on scriptures. I'm coming on. So Hebrew two. Rather, Hebrews 2, verse 10. Or if we start from verse um, 7, or oh, verse 5, it says, For unto the angels are not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. And did set him over the works of thy hands. So speaking of Jesus. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that, he put, in that God put all things in subjection under Christ. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So I know I've told us before that though all things have been put under Christ, but it has not yet manifested. And why is that? Because God himself, the creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It is those sons of God that will bring, that will cause that bringing of everything under Christ to be made manifest. So, it is you and I that are going to do that thing. So, but not yet all things are put under in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So, Christ tasted death for you. Christ tasted death for me. Verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, this is where I'm going. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11 says, But for both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So Jesus Christ calls us brothers. He, he, he said that in bringing many sons unto glory, Christ, the captain of our salvation, was made perfect through sufferings. So that, the focal point is that Christ, the Son of God, the begotten Son of God, brought many other sons into glory. And by the way, even if you're a woman, you're a son of God. Men, we are the bride of Christ. So it is not about um, um, sex or gender. Yeah. So... <laughs> 
Christ brought us, he, he has brought many sons now. So God now has many sons in glory. So it is now our own part. Christ has done his own part. Our own part is now to manifest as sons of God. If you check Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. So he's saying that the person that is the heir, and you know we are heirs of God. The Bible tells us we are heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Christ. So, but he says that the heir, the heir of God, as long as he is a child, is not different from a servant, although he is Lord of all. So, that means God can give us everything, but still, it might not be manifested. God has put everything under the feet of Christ, but still, those things, that, that, that dominion that Christ has, has not yet fully manifested because of a condition. All of us, the other sons of God, are meant to bring this manifestation to pass. So, in the coming weeks, we are going, like next week, by God's grace, we are going to look at those things that mark us out, those things that are our duties, those things that are our realities as sons of God. Number one, one of them is that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If I tell you now, that right now, you are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, can you believe it? Or is it just because we have heard it over and over and over? But the truth is, as we are here, as we are, as we are here, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just as Christ, just as Christ died on the cross, bearing our names and all that, he also went into heaven, taking us along. So as you are here now, you are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Your body might not see it, your, your, you, might not, you might not know it in your body, in your flesh, but I can tell you, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us, when Jesus was saying, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. So he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So the authority that Christ has, we can use it. The Bible tells us we are the light of the world. You know, Jesus Christ himself first called himself, I am the light of the world. But at some point, he said, you, you are the light of the world. The Bible tells us that as he is, so are we in this world. We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. So, those realities of Christ, we need to embrace them. One of the things is that the devil tries to, to, to tell us that those things are not ours, that those realities are not ours, or that we can't enjoy them now. That we can't enjoy them now. There, there, there was someone that um, yesterday when we went for outreach, someone came. I was speaking with someone and then someone else came. I was not saying that. Is there even hope in this world? That there is so much suffering and all. And the man was crying. A grown-up man was crying. There's, there's so much suffering in the world and what is the hope of believers in this world? So you see that the, the enemy tries to make it such that those things that we already have, either it makes us disbelieve that we don't have it. As he was trying to tempt Jesus that if you are the son of God, where that Jesus was already a son of God. The enemy usually will not come and tempt you with something that is not yours already. He just wants you to lose what you have. He wants you to doubt what you have. 
the grace of God is multiplied when we acknowledge those things that are ours in Christ Jesus. So the, we, we, we are not fighting to, to, to get something. We are not trying to do what we are doing to become sons of God. We are sons of God. Because we are sons of God, we do those things. For instance, I don't need to try to force myself to be a Nigerian. No, I'm a Nigerian by birth. There are some things that foreigners would have to would would have to struggle for. No, we we are still getting there, Sha, as a country in Nigeria. But but there are some things that that Nigeria would be great. So I know that there are some things that foreigners would have to struggle for. That we just have easy. Was it not subsidy they reduced? They, they removed in Nigeria that they were um, protesting in Cameroon. I heard they were protesting in Cameroon. So <laughs> the decision here was affecting them. But we 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 are also buying for like 500 though. <laughs> but that doesn't remove the fact that we are Nigerians and the good of the land is ours. So we are sons of God. All those realities in Christ, they belong to us. We don't need to struggle for them. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Yeah, um, We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It is not wrestling to, to win something, to win victory. We have the victory already in Christ. Let that be settled in your heart. We have that victory in Christ. It is the devil that is a rogue. He doesn't play according to the rules. That will try to do something. There are some, have you watched, I don't know how many of us love wrestling. There are some times that it is not lawful. There are some times that it's royal rumble. Like, you can have 20 people in the ring. Everybody just beats each other. Survival of the fittest. Last man standing. That's, that's the person that will be declared the winner. Royal Rumble, you just throw someone out. Once they throw you out, that's all. You have, you are, you are out of the, of, the, of, the, of the contest. But there are some times that it's just two people that are to fight. But I've watched some cases where they will have maybe planted, they will shout, cheat their ways. Maybe someone is at the edge of the ring. Maybe wants to climb something and then jump on the other person. While he's there, someone from outside the ring will just pull him beat him up, throw him back into the ring. So they've beaten him outside. They've done, they've done one or two things. And then they throw him in. So the person is weak. And then the other person that, they, that was supposed to lose, he will just get up, maybe place his leg on the person. And they will count one, two, three. And they say he has won. You know, that's cheating. That's how the devil does. We have the victory already. But the devil is all. is. He is comfortable where there is chaos. If something is going fine, everything is nice. It's, it's not, it's, something is not right in him. He would not like it. But where there is chaos, ah no, he's at home there. So that's what the devil will always like. If, if, he would always come when he sees that this guy, this is the son of God I know. But let me try. Let me still try. If he tried with Jesus, he's going to try with everybody. So, he would want you to doubt that sonship that you have. But if you can stand firm, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. A lot of times, we don't get the results we want because we don't stay long enough. We don't resist him. You know, you, you know resisting is like, like if you are playing ball and someone wants to take the ball from you, you are, it's like you are guiding the person. That's how you are resisting the devil. Because the ball is yours. Those realities in Christ, are, they belong to us. But the devil is trying to make us doubt. He's trying to make us doubt that it's not yours. It's not the, okay, if it's yours, oh yeah, um, if, you, if truly you are the son of God, if you don't know how to fast, if you can't fast um, so, so number of days, you are not the son of God. If you can't do what Jesus did, say, like, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 days, if you can't do it, you are not a son of God. 
If you eat this kind of food, you are not a son of God. You get, you get what I mean? So, those, we are not fighting to receive victory. We already have the victory. We already have the victory in Christ Jesus. Our battle is a battle of occupying. Occupy till I come. It is ours. Just prevent the enemy from gaining access. The, the part of the assignment of Adam was to tend to keep the garden, to tend it. Part of his, his job was to protect it. Was to protect the garden. So the devil wasn't meant to gain access to Eve in the first place. If Adam had done his job well. So that is the kind of that is the kind of, of battle we are fighting. Not that we have lost something and then we are trying to gain it back. No, we have something. The enemy is trying to take it from us. And we are resisting him. Do we understand? You see, it's different. If, we, if, if, you, be, if you see that you have the faith of the Son of God, you know that what Christ can do, you can do also. Jesus himself said, the works that I do, you will do also. And even greater works you will do. Because I go to my Father. So if you believe all those things, you... It's just a change in perception, a change in orientation. And then we can begin to see results. Just light. If a light bulb comes on, you will see everything clearly. That is what we need. Sometimes to stay in victory, all you need is knowledge. The devil will know when you have that knowledge, he can avoid you. Or number one, he might come to test that word. But if you stand firm that you believe that word, you are going to see the results. So today, I want you to go with this reality that I am a son of God. You are a son of God. The enemy cannot, cannot tell me otherwise. Even if I do something wrong, I know all I have to do is repent. It's a family matter. We did not call uh, pastors by. It is a family matter. It is between you and your father. Repent. Mm. You can tell the devil to shut up. You can get him to get lost. Tell him to go places. And he will, he will obey. It is just that knowledge. That, that light that we need to get. When you have that light, when you have that knowledge, the devil also knows his place. So do we understand, if you've been blessed today, I want us to rise up on our feet. I just want you to pray in that confidence today as a son of God. Oh, first of all, I want us to thank, thank God for the, for the privilege of sonship. Let's thank God for the privilege of sonship. Let's thank him for, we, we are sons, we are heirs of God, we are joint heirs with Christ. Let's give him all the praise. Let's give him all the glory. Let's give him all the worship. Let's give him all the praise. Let's give him all the praise. Oh, Father, thank you for the gift of sonship. Thank you, Father, for the gift of sonship. The privilege of sonship. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. All we had to do was just believe. This is the works of God. Just believe in him who he has sent. Oh, Father, thank you for this privilege of sonship. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the children of God, that we should be called the sons of God. Oh, Father, blessed be your name. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sonship that we have. For the privilege of sonship that we have. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sonship. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sonship. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sonship. Oh, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It wasn't something we worked for. It was you yourself that made us worthy. You counted us worthy. Oh, Father, thank you. Father, we bless your name. We bless your name for this privilege. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for drawing us to God through your blood. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because we are sons of God. Thank you, Father. 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 Oh, blessed be your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' name we prayed. And now as a son of God, just imagine yourself as that. I, I, I want that image to settle in your heart that God is your father. And then as a son of God, is there any place where the enemy has been resisting you? Is there any place you've been seeing struggles? Is there any place you've been seeing You've been seeing the enemy attack you. I told you the enemy is a rogue. He does not play according to the rules. I want you to take authority against the enemy. The Bible says resist, resist the devil and he will flee. So the devil cannot stand, cannot stand against you when you stand in your authority. So I want you to stand in your authority in Christ, in your, the privilege of sonship that you have and declare that anywhere the enemy is is is, is doing what is not supposed to do anywhere the enemy is attacking you in any place just begin to declare satan take your hands off satan take off your hands from this area satan take off your hands from this area let's begin to declare decree with your own mouth in the mighty name of jesus over our lives over our affairs over that which pertains to us wherever you satan wherever you enemy you are working we say stay your hand Get out in the mighty name of Jesus. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Satan, we rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus. Satan, we rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus. We enforce the lordship of Jesus Christ. We enforce the authority we have in Christ. And we declare that everything fall into place, into divine order in our lives, in our affairs. In the mighty name of Jesus. Kerebo shante. Rikatan delia zusikerosa. Rekete kedelia. Zida basento. Rekete kebeletusto. Vrumbeku delia zitzisitalia canto zisu brado shigera. Zekete kebregerosto. Satan, you have no right over our lives. We are children of God. Whatever, whatever. Whatever authority or whatever thing you are exercising over our lives, over our fears, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I want you to declare those things you desire to see. You enforce your authority. Declare those things. Why you destroy the things you don't want? Enforce the things you want. Father, we declare. We declare that the will of the Lord is done concerning our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, we prosper. We excel. In the mighty name of Jesus, we rebuke stagnancy. We rebuke stagnancy. We rebuke delay. In the mighty name of Jesus, we receive divine speed. We receive divine speed. In the mighty name of Jesus, our lives come into divine order. In the mighty name of Jesus, Kedekuze Suanterea, Mekukelebu Sante, Brakata Kali Comberia Kotegere Bashante, Dekero Sunterea, Brangorosto, Gruba Kerosta. We declare restoration. Of everything we've lost in the mighty name of Jesus. Let there be full restoration of everything we've lost in the mighty name of Jesus. Kekuna distolo, zibrande kerosia kwazekida, mezisolo prendo sika mosikopina, rekete kebre gerosu tero krushatabia, rekete kebele kusta. Thank you, Jesus. Serabo shantere. Masule kumbra kekuza katagabra gero shatala. 
shatan. I just want us to lift up our hands as I pray. I just want us to lift up our hands as I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. I stand in the authority that is in the name of Jesus and I declare concerning everyone that has, that is part of this service everyone here I declare anywhere the enemy is afflicting you the bible says that affliction shall not rise a second time everywhere the enemy has been afflicting you I command a total stop to those operations of the enemy right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. I say Satan. Take off your hands of the lives of all these precious ones. In the mighty name of Jesus. I declare that the will of the Lord is done. In the lives. In the affairs of these precious ones. In the mighty name of Jesus. I declare restoration. Everywhere you have lost something. I command. Let them be restored to you double according as it is written that for your shame you would have double i declare for everything you have lost for every of your shame i declare double restoration in the mighty name of jesus i declare from henceforth the mercy of god the favor of god the grace of god will work mightily in your life and on your behalf in the mighty name of Jesus, I declare from today, there is a difference between you and those around you. The people see difference that this is God's hand at work. In the mighty name of Jesus, I declare that you receive divine speed. I declare concerning you divine speed. I declare over you divine speed. In the mighty name of Jesus, wherever it is you have, you have, you have, you have missed time i declare that you are you are you are restored all those things you have lost they are restored to you in double fold in the mighty name of jesus whatever accusation the enemy has against you i declare as it is written that christ blotted out every handwriting of ordinance that was against us which was contrary to us he nailed it to his cross therefore i declare that every handwriting of ordinance against you i blot them out by the blood of jesus in the mighty name of Jesus, you are you you are restored to your to, to, to your divine position in the mighty name of Jesus. In experience, your experience aligns with, with your position in Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. No longer will the enemy keep you from those things that are yours in Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. Enjoy all of God. Enjoy the strength of God. Enjoy the fullness of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are we blessed today? Thank you. So, um, if you have your offerings, just um, raise it up. If you want to transfer, you'll be able to... Um, the account number can be shared with you or you can find it on your screen. So you can just raise up your hands. Father, bless everyone giving offerings today. I, 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 I receive for every one of us blessings. Let the heavens be opened over us that, that, that we will receive blessings. Blessings will pour upon us that will not have enough room to take it in in the name of Jesus. And I declare the devourer, you are rebuked concerning us, concerning that which pertains to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We walk in abundance. We walk in the fullness of your goodness. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever in Jesus name. Amen. Zechariah 4, 6 and 7 and the answer that said unto us, this is the word of the Lord unto us in the full redemption chapel, Lagos not by might, not by power but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before us you shall become a plain and we shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. I declare concerning you, grace, grace is your portion in Jesus name. Amen.